Chapter 65 It is with a resigned sadness that Mary closes up their house in Oconomowoc. She would rather tend her flowers than be vice president or even president of the United States. She must, though, accompany her husband. Warble needs her. Money is no object for Warble's presidential campaign. Realizing what a term as president can do for his future, all the connections he can make, deals he can swing, favors he can grant, and more importantly, have reciprocated later, Warble pulls out all the stops. Warble's personal fortune is nothing to sneeze at, even in comparison with the average presidential hopeful. He is still receiving royalty checks from the cascading updates and deletes, and sizable checks for each rerun of Bad Boys Behind Bars, some of which come from foreign countries who have just recently joined the civilized world as regards the owning and watching of television sets. Besides those cash cows, Warble has billions in savings stashed from his insanely successful Biotrans venture. As if that weren't enough greenery to choke a horse, or even a Warble, the presidential hopeful continues to get kickbacks from various cheese, beer, brat, and frozen custard companies in Wisconsin, through deals engineered by Wardleberry Dane, the new acting governor of that state. As governor of Wisconsin, Warble had held a weekly State of the State radio address. As president, he plans to upgrade the media involved. Mary, I'm going to go from radioactive to television active. Each week I will go before the camera for a full hour, addressing the nation's concerns and informing them of the amazing progress I will have made within that past week. Warble doesn't particularly care for the two major political parties which he usually either refers to as Tweedledee and Tweedledum or Kissin' Cousins. So he doesn't affiliate himself with either one. In fact, he knows that his administration will be so fundamentally different from any that came before that he forms his own party. All this takes is an application filled out in triplicate, along with a $314 processing fee and two barcode strips from any specially marked box of post cereal. Self-effacingly enough, Warble designates the new party Warbletarians. Warble's grand plan is as follows. Grease the wheels. Bribe whomever he can. Go on the campaign trail. And finally, the night before the election, as a rousing finale, engage in a debate with the other candidates. It doesn't take long for word to get out about Warble's agenda. Soon, he is approached by a coalition of corporations to carry out the ORRH, Operation Reverse Robin Hood, if they contribute to his campaign. In a nutshell, this operation revolves around the basic idea that Warble will raise corporate revenue by shifting the tax burden from the philanthropic, pitiable, put-upon megacorporations, the benefactors of all mankind, to the freeloaders and leeches of our society meaning primarily retirees, single-parent families, the sick, and the handicapped. What Warble will get in return for his promise of cooperation is nothing less than the wholehearted support of these corporations in the upcoming election. A deal is struck in record time, both sides being quite satisfied with the benefits they expect to accrue as a result thereof. Next, Warble assembles a crack marketing team to help him run his campaign. To be fair, though, not all of them are on crack. After weeks of intense effort, all-night brainstorming sessions and meticulous demographic surveys, they come up with the following campaign slogans. Warble and Mary in 2004. What more could you reasonably ask for? McGorkle and McGorkle. This pair won't cause you to lose your hair. What would Warble do? Warble ain't that horrible. Warble likes the last one best, but he can't decide whether they should retain the word that or not. In other words, should it be Warble ain't that horrible, or simply Warble ain't horrible? He feels that the first one implies he is horrible, but not to such a great extent or degree. On the other hand, he feels it has more of a ring to it than the curt Warble ain't horrible. After tossing and turning all night and thus failing to get his natural rest which makes Warble quite cranky. He decides to settle the issue once and for all by swarming the country with a veritable army of pollsters. After an expenditure of $3,141,592.65, 
A definitive conclusion is extrapolated from the scientific results assessed. 50.1% of the people choose the version with the that in it for its flowing meter and evocative tonal quality, as many termed it. Warble is able to sleep like a baby after that, satisfied and content. Every penny expended was well spent, necessary, and an investment in our future, he tells Mary. Who would like to expand her flower garden and doesn't understand why they can't afford the few dollars it would take to do so? Armed with invisible hands helping him out in various ways and areas, and with the real Jim Dandy slogan, Warble hits the campaign trail. After paying a certain Jack Reynolds to customize his car so that he can stand up in it and wave as he tours the nation, Warble christens it the Warble Mobile and makes it all official by tapping it with a bottle of Stephen O'Zinfandel. He doesn't break the bottle, not wanting to waste any of the crimson fluid, and because he wants to set the proper example of frugality to all those viewing the scene on television. Starting out from Oconomowoc, Warble goes on a whistle-stop tour of America. Standing up in the Warble Mobile, he whistles until somebody tells him to stop, signaling, or so Warble thinks anyway, that they are dying to hear one of his speeches. Warble's immediate acceptance by the downtrodden of America, which is, of course, a majority, and immense popularity with the trotters as well, the former because he promises to help them, the latter because they know he's fibbing, is unprecedented. So rabid are his backers that a new phrase is coined, Warble Mania. Signifying the sea change evident among the public, Time magazine runs its third cover story of Warble. The first time was as the colorblind chameleon, and the second was as the founder of Biotrans, and entitles that issue, The Warbling of America. In Warble's charismatic speeches, he weaves the old with the new and the borrowed with the blue. He promises to implement sweeping changes in American society in general, and politics in particular. Warble calls this the new leaf. He asserts that the improvements achieved upon his election will be so striking, so fundamental, that the manner of reckoning time will be readdressed. All the years prior to his election in 2004 will be termed B.W., whereas the time period following 2004 will fall into the A.W. era, before Warble and after Warble. Even the children get caught up in Warble fever, and the most popular video game of the season is Where's Warble? Although he is so far ahead in the polls as to make any chance of losing seem virtually impossible, Warble's kick him when they're down instinct spurs him on. He promises the public that he will pay them $50 for each vote. All they need to do to receive their payment following his election is to take a photograph of their ballot after selecting his name and after the inauguration send it to Accounts Payable, care of the White House. In a calculated effort to stir up the procrastinators and the avaricious, Warble also offers an extra reward to the first ones in each state that vote for him and provide photographic evidence of such. They will procure for themselves their choice of either a fish or a fishing license. Warble explains that the fish is, in this case, a government bond for $10,000. The fishing license, on the other hand, is Warble's personal assistance in becoming the next governor of the state in which they reside. Never one to be shy, Warble spreads his message everywhere. After being briefed by his campaign handlers on which issues matter the most to the voting public, Warble explains how he will single-handedly solve all these problems. Crime and War any time you feel irritated with anybody, give him, her, or them a virtual hug, or group hug. Don't really hug them, just imagine that you are hugging them. After all, some of the potential huggies may have B.O. Public Health I will ban all staff meetings. Thus, staff infections will be prevented. One infection at a time, I will eradicate sickness. Unemployment and the Economy I will pass a law that requires everyone to purchase at least three items each day. One from the county in which they reside, one outside the county but within the state where they make their home, and one outside the state but within the United States. In this way, I'll fix the economy one nation at a time, ours first. 
This change to the economy will benefit all in the country, not just those in particular states as happened in Europe when they introduced the Greek sand, which is the pan-European currency. This edict helped Greece, of course, and the sheep herding countries such as Turkey, and even serendipitously for them, as they are not even in Europe and have no business benefiting from European shenanigans, New Zealand. However, which shows just how stupid those Europeans are, all the other countries are hurt by this switch to a Greek sandwich-based economy. Look at Switzerland, for example. As a direct result of this change, having scarcely any mutton within their borders, they had to license one of their mountains to Disneyland in order to pay off just a portion of the interest on their quickly mounting foreign debt. Education. This is not a problem whatsoever, and I don't understand why this wasn't fixed long ago, as the solution is so obvious. There are a lot of know-it-alls in this country, and a lot of blooming idiots. All the know-it-alls will be required by law to spend 10 hours each month educating the idiots. Before you know it, we will be a country of know-it-alls. The Environment Heed this tip. No more faxes. Documents faxed each year require the cold-blooded annihilation of more than 31,415,926 trees. Just say no to faxes and all the related problems will be solved. Deforestation will stop, the glaciers will refreeze, global warming will reverse, and with the time we save that we used to spend standing by fax machines, we will have more time to smile, which, as we all know, solves all kinds of mental ills, social problems, and alleviates health concerns to boot. Both of the major party candidates, or should I say, traditional party candidates, as the Warbletarian party can certainly be termed major now, fear Warble immensely. They don't think they stand a snowball's chance in Dallas of even remaining standing, in a political sense, that is, after their upcoming debate with Warble. Nevertheless, in this, they underestimate Warble P. McGorkle.